trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the latest edition of The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. We'll have a cheer, please, from everybody in the globe this evening. We are amongst friends once again, and it is very, very good to be out and about. We have swapped our normal cupboard. I think it's meant to be called a studio, but we swapped our cupboard for the pub. And quite frankly, I cannot recommend it enough. Tonight, we are in a proper old boozer. Uh, we are with friends, both in terms of Green King and Red Bull, who have done an incredible job, I hope you'll all agree, in transforming this into a spectacular venue. Uh, the ultimate viewing experience, and this is the best seat in the house to watch the Six Nations matches this year. We'll have a cheer, please, for Green King and for Red Bull as well, our friends tonight. Um, Normally, we like to sort of recline in splendour in armchairs, but we've been given some very impressive prehistoric benches tonight. So what we'll need to do is to fill the benches. We'll start just with four very large buttocks. So would you please give a very warm welcome to you, two of the usual crew, ladies and gents, Mr. James Haskell and Mr. Ben Kayser. Come on up, chaps. Well done, the boss. Bonjour, bonsoir. Ça va bien. Don't get too comfortable, because we've got... We've got large buttocks to come and sit next to you as well. But just before we do that, um, what a weekend we had in Rome, first of all, with England Rugby Travel. Have you stopped smiling since? Yeah, I have. It was good. It was fantastic. I mean, the rugby was a bit dull, yeah. but the, the food was lovely. The good. experience, the vista. We're, we're amongst England fans. Can we just check that we all enjoyed it, even if Haas didn't? Did we yeah. enjoy the performance of the weekend, England, Italy? Good, yeah. yeah. Know your audience. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, it was lovely, but the most ex the fun part about it was whizzing around Rome on those scooters, <laughs> watching Alex, who was obviously a well-to-do, little Lord Fauntleroy on his best, going around on a battery scooter trying not to kill himself with Mike Tyndall leading the way, who actually fell off one. Yeah, that could have been, yeah. a, you know, the Queen's got COVID, we could have lost Mike 50-50 on who, <laughs> would the nation be just distraught? Um, but no, it was, Rome, was, Rome was wonderful. The game was great. I think it's a great um, way to get back on the horse, as it were, after after Scotland. But was it the most exciting encounter? No. Is it always a means to an end? Of course. But actually, what a beautiful um, city Rome is. And let's be honest, you know, I know everyone's sort of quite adamant about bringing Georgia in, but pff, I'm not into an away day there. <laughs> Got my tin hat and bear in it. I'm not really, I'm not really quite keen. I quite enjoyed. There was one, there was one afternoon where. You know, we worked quite hard, contrary to what it might look like on social media, where Alex and I were sitting next to the Coliseum. He was desperate for a bit of lemon sorbet, as most middle-class men are on an away trip away from their <laughs> What family. goes on tour stays yeah, on sorry, tour, Ash, sorry. for Christ's sake. Like, he goes, listen, I just, honestly, I could really do with some lemon sorbet. So, um, well, if you want some lemon sorbet, we shall get you some lemon sorbet. So we're sitting opposite the Coliseum, a little espresso in hand, a little lemon sorbet. I might have had a martini as well, just keeping it very, you know, metrosexual. And, um, yeah, we, had, we sort of watched the, the, the world go by. It was very, very privileged. And then, obviously, England won, and then we, you and I were on the red eye chasing to get to the airport while Mike Tyndall kept the social side of, of it up for a couple more days. And actually, I think he's still on the piss now because he doesn't bother turning up for the show. Um, I want to talk to you about Paris in a moment or two, but any breaking news this week? Yeah, it was a small thing um, that my wife and I are expecting our first child. Come on, ladies and gents. Um... I think if you listen back and you listen very carefully, there may even have been an R, ah, yeah, which is the was. first one of those that you've is. ever had on planet Earth. Um, many, many congratulations to both of you. We'll have another cheer for Hask and for Chloe and for Mini Hask as well. I'm very, I, I am obviously very, very excited. Um, you know, having a little girl as well, which is, is going to be mega. I mean, let's hope she has her mother's looks. Otherwise, she's going to be the next top wrestler from Great Britain. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah, she's going to be stuffed, isn't she? Because also as well, imagine when she comes into a room, sweet, innocent, little mini potato Haskell. We haven't decided a name, but, you know, we're going to go with potato. And, uh, and she comes in and they go, oh, your dad's James Haskell. And then she'll be followed around her entire life by a sharp intake of breath, like, 
Oh, thank God. She won't be allowed a phone, ever. Yeah. She won't be allowed to... My back catalogue of things on Google, not good. It's like when I went to school, my dad, my dad told me that he was head boy and told me that he was all these things and achieved all these things. And when I went to school the first day, a teacher went, oh, Mr. Haskell, I knew your father, tutted, and I looked on all the boards from where my dad was. There was no mention of head boy, no mention of playing for the first team, no mention of anything else. And he went, oh, James, it wouldn't be. It was lost in the great fire. <laughs> And then I said, well, I doubt I couldn't find evidence of the great fire. I went, oh, I was lost in the great flood. So, uh, so I think she's going to get pretty much similar treatment. I, I can tell you I know exactly about that sharp intake of breath after the last two years. And <laughs> long may that continue as well. Um, well done to you both. Have you had a quieter week? Anything exciting happening in your world? Not a, as quite as exciting as this, but I love it how our guests that you're going to introduce in a few minutes just sat down and said, oh, you know, is there a bit of a, a content, a script, you know, sort of something that we need to write? But I think clearly there's absolutely zero scripts, right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't take this genuine side of Haas just coming up, but sincerely, congratulations, because I think, um, I think you guys make a great couple, and Thank I you. think you guys will absolutely rock it, so stay yourself and it'll be beautiful. Um, how is Paris? Rome is incredible. How was Paris? I was going to say, I think you should have mentioned it at some point. If you guys had such a good weekend, it's also because there was a delightful game of rugby played in Paris, right? Facing the two best European teams at the moment. There actually currently. was. And do you know what Mike Tyndall said to us? He goes, listen, lads, I want to give you a very traditional experience. Massive game. France versus Ireland. We're in the heart of Rome. There's the Colosseum. There is the Vatican. There's everything. The Sistine Chapel. And he took us to a hard rock cafe. <laughs> <laughs> to watch the game. And the game consisted of all of us sitting around the table, about 20 people like smashing in the pints because we're absolute lads. And we're having a drink. And every now and then we just see the game and then someone would just shout something obligatory, go on the blur! Or when that Hanson... Or was it Hanson? Matt Hanson. Matt, yeah, Matt Hanson. I know a lot about rugby. When he... <laughs> yeah. When the one in the green scored the try against the one in the blue, it was, it was great. You know, so we, we, did, we did fully appreciate it, but we were sort of quite... It, steadily into a quite entertaining day, I think. We're coming to Paris with England Rugby Travel again for the final round, and I'm hoping we'll do better for the earlier games than a Hard Rock Cafe, or whatever it is. You'll treat us to something very special. It will be my pleasure. Good, looking forward to it. Um, lots of, obviously, big rugby to come this weekend, but I think, given we're in London, I think we can safely say that Twickenham is the biggest game of the weekend. England-Wales, can we have a cheer for England-Wales? Good, yeah, we're amongst friends. So with that in mind, we have got the perfect guest. Would you please give an enormous welcome to an enormous character? 75 caps for Wales, three grand slams, and three times the British and Irish Lions. Ladies and gents, it's the governor of Welsh rugby, Mr Ryan Jones. Come on in, Skips, how are you? Lovely to see you. Well, first time I take both of us. Yeah. There's a lot of weight going oh. through this bench. That is half a ton of fun right there between the two of you, isn't it? It's the first time I've seen you look small for a while. You're looking extremely well, though. How are you? It's lockdown, mate. There's no need to make it personal. Yeah, I really good, thanks. Yeah. Are you, are you keeping fit? Are you working hard? Uh, just well, I wouldn't say working hard. Trying to stay healthy as it yeah. is, but yeah, life's good and it's great to be here, isn't it? I tell you what, though, the last time I saw him was two years ago at the Medeski. Times are obviously hard. That's why he's down in... Times must still be hard. That's why he's in London on a Monday night whizzing around any bit of cash. And um, we, were in, um, we were at the Medeski. VAT, obviously. VAT, we're obviously. Going through the accounts, absolutely. Yeah, HMRC, yeah. nothing to see here. Tax deductible. And we were in, um, at the Medeski doing a, a dinner. And, you know, obviously, we played against him many times, legend of the, legend of the game. And, um, but he was 95 kilos, right, and looked decidedly ill. I, I was on the phone to a relative going, I think we need to set up a Just Giving page for, you know, because I don't think he's got a long to, you know, I thought it was quite one of them touch and go. And then he told me, through, I tried to lead up to it because I didn't want to go, listen, what the hell's happened to you? Because he was a shadow of his former self. And then he decided that he was doing Iron Men. Do you want to tell everyone, you know, he decided he was doing Iron Men, it was 95 kgs. It was 15 hours out the house, you know, and I've got three kids, you've got this to come, so I was doing everything I can. This is what, this is what, is like that my agent? I'm taking up Iron Man. <laughs> this is what 125 kilos of muscle pre-kids looks like, and this yeah. is what 125 kilos with three kids <laughs> as a dad looks like, so you've got all this to come, mate. But you were, you were, you were the slimmest you've ever been, weren't you? Yeah, I was, yeah, with 6% body fat and could run wow. all day, but... Uh, Why? Because you're not the you're not the first to go into that. What what, what was no. the call of the Iron Man? Well, I, I had to retire in the end through injury, as most of us most of us have to. And you know, I'd had op I got plates in both legs or both my knees done. You thought you'd do so, running? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. This, this, that is the, that 
that is the story. I don't know why I'm laughing. Yeah, I thought yeah. I'd take so, up MMA. I mean, so, you know. And I've had shoulder reconstructions and all this type of stuff. And the, and the doctor sat there and said, look, enough's enough. 35 years of age, you know, you just need to call it a day. There's nothing more we can, we can do. I said, well, what does the future look like? He said, well, I suggest you don't do any running. He said, swimming's probably out, out the window, and, but you might be all right cycling. So I thought, well, Ironman seems like a natural progression. So sort of six months later, on my second triathlon, I swam, what, 2.4 miles, cycled 112, and ran a marathon all in 12 and a half hours. Wow. So, that is bloody impressive. It's, it's, interestingly, though, like, you, you must have it, because even though you, even physically you've got to retire, right? Your body's just... But it just there's a part of you that doesn't die the day you retire, is it? So you've gone into MMA, oh, no, of course. so you do weights and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've no, got no interest into it, because I was good at rugby, so I didn't have to rely on my physique. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, what, yeah. <laughs> what was your skill set? I used to just hit people, that was about it. <laughs> Catching, that was optional. No, no, I'm joking, I was... Bloody amazing. Watch the highlight reels. They're all over YouTube. If not, I'll send it to you. If you Give my wife your email and I'll, I'll send you it a highlight. It won't take long. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we talked about on the show, like, uh, you know, I, I train sort of three times a week and I, I have to bin myself a couple of times a week to go through a bit of turmoil because otherwise you go a bit stir crazy. It's just that I know my limitations. I mean, I couldn't do a sprint triathlon, let alone do an Ironman. Because you were honestly looked completely different. Now I'm kind of a bit happier. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, I want, you know, the bigger, friendlier giant now. Thanks, thanks. No, I'll get back to it. it it's something that I've, I've really enjoyed. I enjoy that sort of whole endurance type piece. But I'm more into my sort of running now and we'll go back into, into yeah. that all the time. Have you got a thing that you need to... Or are you quite happy just running, studying and reading? Enough. and Front row forward. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I barely could run even when I was a professional athlete. Well, at least seen as a professional athlete so there's absolutely zero chance I think this um, it's, it's really interesting whenever we try to compare ourselves to anybody else you know that there's uh, rugby players are really really tough right and then you you compare yourself to, I don't know to uh, militaries well it's a different ball game you want you want to do a bit of running and you can tear you compare all the our tests and our beeps and our bronco and whatever you would call them and you even comp start to compare with the Ironman and we're off the charts too so Huge amount of respect because it was definitely absolutely not my forte to do in going to endurance. But um, I would have, you know, cheered you on the whole way. So what is it you would do, though, to release some of that? Or are you just so French and relaxed that you don't no, no, have no. a good one? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, told, I told you what happened. I retired 16th of June 2019, did absolutely fuck all for four weeks. <laughs> First week, I was, we it's went French, on holiday. French, you get away with it. <laughs> you say excuse my French? He actually said it, so it's fine. I have. Um... And, and first week, just went on holiday, did absolutely nothing. And my wife was asking me, are you going to do something? Like this? 16 years, almost twice a day, I'm done with that, right? First week, second week, great fun. Twice a day, or the... <laughs> <laughs> now we're touring. <laughs> Third week, fourth week, whatever, I was losing my mind, to be honest. I was, I was getting snappy, I was getting angry for no reason. I think it's just, it's just about releasing that, that energy. Like you said, you need to, we need to flog ourselves from time to time. So no, CrossFit it does it for me. Short and sharp, really, really hard. Weights, whatever it is, bit of boxing. Definitely not, no running, no swimming. I, I sink, I will be terrible. But, um, but it's, it's definitely in the head more than anything. It's more about releasing that and staying fit in the head. I do Pilates and ballet if anyone's <laughs> asking, but uh, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> if you're ever going to look at a yoga body, that is a, that's a yoga rig right there. Shut up your face. Um, just go, so we've got a few bits of, of news obviously come through. Just emotions at full time at the Principality, Wales, Scotland. Relieved, delighted, ecstatic. Oh, relief, I think, is the, yeah. the overriding emotion on the huge, you know, totally outplayed and outmuscled in, in Ireland the week before. Come to Scotland, Scotland bottled it again, you know. It's, you know they've, started, they've got a history of coming to Cardiff as favourites and not delivering, and they, 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 they didn't disappoint. So, <laughs> gifted Wales nine points early on, and, you know, Wales, Wales, Wales ground out a result. You know, they're not going to be hugely enamoured by the way they played. They still look like a fairly blunt attacking instrument right now. They're going to need to find some sort of creative flair. But, as we know, in a competition like this, when the fixtures come around thick and fast, Coming to Twickenham on the back of a win is a far better place than, yeah. than coming on the back of another loss. I, I was there for French TV. Yeah. And I know, I know that Hask, you said something really nice about Dan Bigger and stuff. But I must say, I was blown away by, as a captain, how he stood up and he just bit the bullet, right? Because I think he got hit just before halftime. He's about to come off at halftime. And then he stays in the game and he stays in the game and he obviously kicks the drop goal, gets bollocked by everybody else because they think it's a poor decision, which ends up being key at the end. And I was just looking at this bloke... Per, 
constantly getting up and just being resilient and facing how hard it was because they were getting really, really pushed. And then at the end, the final thing that you think, you know, surely he's, he's done his hero move. You know, he wants to kick it to touch before he gets subbed. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. He's going to get subbed off by Kelly Mishidi, I think it was the guy from Bristol. And he asked the ref, can I still kick it out before I get subbed? You know, he really wanted to do absolutely to the last drop of it. I was blown away by, by how strong he was. So he's had, he's had great captain role models over the years, you know, having played underneath me at the Ospreys and then at Wales, you know, he's certainly learned from the learned from the best. But no, he is, he's an unbelievable competitor, Dan. You know, I don't think we give him credit for how tough he is. You know, yeah. he backs it up week in, week out. But he's a, he's a great story where he, he turned up at the Ospreys as a sort of 14, 15 year old kid and at 16 years of age. He, on his own, on, off his own back, he went in to meet Lynn Jones and Sean Olley, the then Ospreys coaches, and went in the office and he said, I just want to introduce myself. My, my name's Dan Bigger. I'm going to be the next Ospreys 10 <laughs> behind Gavin Enson and James Huck. And, and that was it. And out the office he walked. But that was, you know, that was his confidence as a, as a young kid. You know, he's got this unbelievable belief in his own ability and, and, and that of those around him. But he's a real tough sort of taskmaster, he expects sort of perfection of people around him. You were brilliant about it last week. I mean, someone you, I think you said last week, someone you didn't expect to, to like yeah. but loved. And you can just kind of see what he does for those around him. Yeah, I, I think if you don't know a lot about him and, you know, exactly what these guys have said, the competitive spirit, you know, in training, you know, if someone drops a ball, I mean, I, I, my first experience with someone like that was Alex King when Joe Simpson was, was playing for Was and he... And he passed the ball to Alex King and it went at shin height and Alex King just volleyed it back and just said this is bullshit we don't you know we don't want this nonsense and Dan Bigger was very much like that but every time he played for Wales you kind of get these chippier characters Johnny Sexton who is, is, is a, another legend but very chippy on the field Dan Bigger again the ultimate competitor Andy Good actually was very similar and especially with those those fingerless gloves a bit like you know the guy from like Steptoe and Son he had those sort of you know and the and skullet it, for a skull, long time. So that's gone skull, yeah. now. It's been repaired. And he'd, and he'd, he'd, tap, he'd rub his hands all over your face and graze your face and give you a bit of chat. Dan Bigger was kind of that quite chippy character. But actually, when I, when I met him on the Lions tour, and I think I ended up spending a bit of time with him because we were in the sort of a midweek team, I was like, do you know what? I'm just never going to get on with this guy. And we, we instantly clicked because off the field, very compassionate, very calm, really nice, very humble, but the ultimate competitor on it and very clear about the standards he expected. And actually... I was talking to a journalist upstairs and they were asking me about kind of Tom Curry and, and the leadership thing. And actually, I think it's clear Tom Curry's an amazing player and he's definitely a leader that you would follow into battle. Is he probably the most you know, verbose or articulate guy? Potentially not. But Dan Bigger is was someone that would you would want in your side alongside a Tom Curry who would articulate things, would be a very emotional. I've seen him kick off in the middle of training and say, listen, the standards aren't good enough, mm. but that actually makes the team better. Um, and obviously on the field, he, he plays incredibly well. And to do that, you know, because Dan, he's had a couple of injury things, you know, he, he, some concussion stuff. You know, I've seen him playing for Northampton. But for him to dig in, play, then make those decisions, perform, to see the passion to be captain, for him to deliver, is, it was amazing. And he's a, he's a good lad as well. Ultimately, if you're a good bloke, most of us are quite forgiving. If you're, a, <laughs> if you're an absolute nightmare, and you're a nightmare on and off the field, we pretty much bin you. You know what I mean? There's a, lot of, there's a few of them around. We won't name names, but there's a lot of them where you go, oh, he's so sweet. You're like, yeah, he's a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to come back to England Wales in a moment. I want to deal with a couple of the headlines from this week. Um, there was a sort of a storm in it. Was it a storm in a teacup? Italy out of the Six Nations, South Africa possibly coming in. No to South Africa, Italy are staying. I mean, carry on, nothing to see here? Or is there, is there a little something happening? I, I don't know about the inside info. All I know is that there's a problem with Italy, yes, because we are absolutely delighted to go to Rome, but at the same time, the, the, the competitiveness of Six Nations depends. A bit like, don't get me wrong, the French definitely slipped up for 10 years and everybody's delighted to see them back, me number one, because the whole competition is super, is hot, right? Don't get me wrong. But South Africa has nothing to do in Six Nations. And I love the South Africans and I, I adored what they did in 2019, but it just doesn't fit with the history of what we've done for the last 30 years and the reason why we adore this tournament. So I just don't think, you, you know, you can't try to make things work for the sake of economy or for the sake of even extraordinary rugby displayed, which it would be. I would be chuffed to see them. It's just not Six Nations. Okay. Do you have a view on 34 consecutive losses and not a point for Italy loss? How, how much longer can you keep going with a side that is not with the pack? Well, but, but all the contractual... Once we're handing out free limoncello after every meal, we can probably handle it for another 35 <laughs> losses. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose the, the commercial's the one side because there's a whole host of legal things in there that we'll, we'll see Italy stay, you know? We've got to be careful what we wish for around the whole 
relegation promotion thing, which is another thing bandied for, because none of us want to find ourselves coming fifth or sixth and, you know, ended up in tier two for a, any period of time. Look, there's, I don't think there's, there's no smoke without fire, is there? So that conversation is undoubtedly going on and based, probably based on the economics of that African market is enormous. So South Africa, South Africa don't also fit in the Southern Hemisphere with New Zealand and all, so where do they, where do they fit? Is it time for an evolution? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, the old romantic in me thinks the Six Nations is as great as it is. But, you know, it was the Five Nations before Italy joined, wasn't it? And we were promising hope for big things and it probably hasn't materialised on the field. Do I think the conversation's going on? Yeah, I, you know, I, I reckon they are. You know, the fact they've come out and denied it probably gives us the clue that it, it is. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they... Because there are the two off weekends as well. Yeah. Which would lend itself, so... Watch this space. Watch this space. I mean, Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to what you might think, my finger isn't necessarily on the rugby pulse. Um, I mean, I heard it, because I, I was picking... I, I, I sort of circulate between... Instagram, Daily Mail Online, Sky Sports. I, I actually heard it and I was like, great. Uh, this is just my personal opinion. So obviously, I think a lot of things in rugby are based on tradition and heritage, right? So we, we, we've always done it, so we need to continue to do it. And I think that's what holds us back a lot of the time. Now, I'm, I, I love, um, you know, I'm nostalgic. I love those moments. But actually, you know, if there isn't a home for South Africa and they want to come over here and play... I think it would improve everything. I think it would make it even more of a of a of a of a spectacle. I you know I I love Italy. I, you know I don't really sorry. Do you want no, to I, was gonna, I was gonna no, I was gonna quickly finish. Oh, fine. But, but I'll probably be waiting for a fucking while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll wake you up when he's done, well, Brian. Once, once we get a couple of drinks while we're waiting. Once the lecture's finished, you can please feel free to ask questions. Um, no, and, and I I actually don't. I, I actually didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was great. I I I, I think exactly what what he's saying. The, the, the conversation has 100% happened. It's a bit like Boris Johnson going, you know, I didn't know it was a party. You're like, you did. We all knew, knew it was a party. It's a bit like that. They've 100% had those conversations. Something's leaked out and they've gone, oh yeah. shit, everyone doesn't want it. Uh, we, we weren't going to do it. You know, boop. I, I think it would actually improve it. I don't have a problem with it. I think Italy, unfortunately, are great. They aren't improving quick enough. Add South Africa into the mix. It would make it much more competitive. We are trying to run a commercial game. This is about bums on seats, spectacle, everything else. It's not about hanging on to traditions and the values of the game, in my opinion. Yeah, for, for me, the biggest clue is South African teams into the URC, private equity into domestic rugby, private equity's come into Six Nations, private equity's gone in the South. We're only going one way, are we, really? Speculation. What's the down I don't know what the downside is, because oh, I saw loads of people, like like the archetypal old-school journalists, going, we will not have this. And it's like, well, first of all, we don't care what you think, but articulate why, and it's always like, well, because we, you know, we, we just can't have it. Why? Well, because tradition, we'll put tradition to one side. <laughs> Adding South Africa into that mix would make it more competitive. The African market is huge. We, we're trying to make rugby more sustainable. You know, we want it to make it more interesting. Adding that absolute kind of But you're also trying to make it more competitive. So cutting off a team that's under 20 side is now beginning well, to beat England and under 18 yeah, won four out of five yeah, last it's year. It's business, isn't it? It's business. I didn't, I didn't get, you know, we haven't got the best-selling podcast in the world just because we're jolly good chaps. Because if not, I'd be president does, of America. Does help. If that was the case. Yeah, right. Okay. The other thing is, Cape Town in February would be really shit, right? That's what I mean, right, you know. I'll tell you what, let's get rid of Wales, because Cardiff's awful and like that. Let's keep... Oh, yeah. right. oh, actually, I'll tell you what, let's bin off, let's bin off Scotland and Wales, because nobody wants to go there. Rome, check. Cape Town, check. New London, York. check. New, New York. York, check. Right. France, Paris, check. I'm into it. Ireland, Dublin, they love the smash, check. Right. Forget that. So, yeah, don't worry, bin the other ones off. I, I won't be bothered. We, we're disappearing down a, a sort of path uh, which we've been down many times before. Let's try and come back. What I'd love to do at this point is to welcome a really good friend of ours, Elmer Smith. So, Elmer, come on up, who's the host of The Good, The Scars, and The Robbie. Can we have an enormous round of applause, hey. please, as Elmer comes on in? See yourself onto the, the bench. That is quite a front row. Hask, will you give Elmer your mic? That's lovely. Um, Hask is... is is not talking a lot of sense. We've heard a lot from the Italians uh, this week. We haven't heard very much out of South Africa. You are very au fait with everything that's happening down there. Just give us a little sense. Is this something that's popped up in Johannesburg, Cape Town, etc., and has died again? Where has this story come from? I would bet that it came from Italy because no one has ever defended Italy's position in this tournament as hard as they have in the last very two weeks. True. This is probably the best PR the Italian Rugby Union could have ever asked for, which is really interesting. What people seem to forget is that South Africa lost to Italy in 2018, 2017, 
not too long ago. Yeah. Um, and so the recent form of the Springboks is, I think, something that intimidates many rugby fans, but um, it's not that consistent over the last 10 years. What is interesting out of South Africa is that a lot of people went, so what? Because why did anyone think South African teams joined the URC? I was the, the person hosting build-ups when we played the Sunwolves in Super Rugby. It's very hard to convince anyone to tune in to TV to watch rugby at 5.30 on a Saturday morning. Yeah. It's also very hard to convince people to have a braai, a few brandies, and stay together enough to watch the Springboks or a South African club sign play a match in Argentina that only kicks off at 1.30 in the morning. So when people say, oh, but we don't want money ruining the game, it's not about that. It's about the game actually surviving. It's very hard to build a broadcast product when you're trying to serve the entire Southern Hemisphere because the time zones are so far removed. So the fact that in the 90s when rugby professionalized, we somehow sliced the globe in half along the equator is probably the biggest mistake we made when rugby professionalized because if you want the sport to go forward and prosper and be that rock nation superstar kind of glamour, then you have to cut it according to time zones so that people will actually watch. Would South Africans therefore, are they, are they up for joining the Six Nations? Oh, or, do, sure. or is the history against New Zealand and Australia what, the lure that they still want? Well, I, I also find that a little hard to believe. So Wales, for example, will only play South Africa once more a year. Yeah. Um, England will only play South Africa once more a year. We still have, at this stage, Wales coming to South Africa in June, July this year. So there's going to be a three-test series there. And I think that if basically South Africa's rugby world turns on its head, all it will allow is for the Springboks to have an off-season, which at this stage, with Springbok players playing in the URC over Christmas over January, December and January, which was usually the off-season in South Africa. At the moment, the Springboks have no off-season. So what this would do is to just recalibrate the South African rugby season along time zones, because there's only a two-hour time difference at the moment. And in, in our summer in the UK, it's only an hour. And it's an 11-hour flight to Cape Town, and you can have a pint for a pound. <laughs> Why would you not want to visit? Therein is the unique selling point that we're looking for. Um, so, qu quick final question, because I, I just want to ask you, we're, we're hearing lots and lots about the global calendar at the yeah. moment, and obviously th there's, there's, I think, progress being made and made quite quickly, but do you see South Africa sort of looking around a bit at the moment and wondering where they're going to bed in, or do you think that they're going to find what it is that they're looking for in terms but, of that natural home? Yeah, I don't think this is something that anyone just came up with over the December holiday when the Rassi was dancing on, on Twitter. Um, like this, this Good isn't moves. this isn't just an idea that someone cooked up over a brandy and coke in front of a braai. This has been years in the making. It's been a transition that's been a very long time coming. Um, South Africa is uniquely positioned in that it can play Southern and Northern Hemisphere rugby at the same time because there is so much talent. In 2017, we had a thousand and eighty-two professional rugby players in South Africa. 1,082 people earning a living from playing rugby. That is a lot of talent. And there's probably as many outside of the country. Yeah. So it is the kind of country that if it can have a really viable north-south competition that it plays in at club level and at international level, it would probably also be able to cross-fund teams still playing in the southern hemisphere, but different teams. But there is so much talent there that... It would just give people, and when you hear Siakulisi's story, you understand why the significance of rugby cannot be overstated. Gives more people more opportunities. So nice to have so much sense being spoken into Hask's microphone for once. <laughs> Elmer, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Great to get the lowdown. Elmer Smith, uh, we shall watch this space with great interest. It's actually a shame that Elmer isn't available to present this podcast, because <laughs> she might well be quite soon. The talent's great, but the presenter, mm. <laughs> Do listen to The Good, The Scars and The Rugby if you'd like far more we sense just spoken. Don't clear up that Elmer and I were exactly on the same page. Just she delivered it in, in a complete... Uh, in an no articulate, well, sellable, she, she viable, went, oh understandable... God, you know, we had a little bit of a bry and they did a brandy yeah. and a coke and everyone fell over. But that's basically what we were saying. Yes. Get South Africa in, sack off Wales, we're in. <laughs> that's what I'm hearing.
watch this space. I think there might be one or two announcements in the not too distant future. A couple of other bits. Um, Jack Willis, friend of the show, back after 53 weeks out having his knee rebuilt, which is great to see. I mean, he, yeah, look, Jack Good Willis is, um, you know, is an incredible player who has had the worst luck with injuries possible. You know, he played... I mean, this was absolutely no coincidence, but I attended the Royal Wedding when I was supposed to play because I was actually injured. And he went and played on a broken ankle and then did his knee. So not only did he t play the game with a broken ankle, he then did all the ligaments in his other knee and was out. And so basically was being stretched around with two legs up in the air. Recovered from that, obviously played incredibly well. Had that game for England, got unfortunately got his knee done and hasn't played since, but came back. He subsequently had a kid. So it was amazing to see him out on the field play and then go into the stand, pick up his little boy and have that kind of moment because I don't think that people appreciate... And look, I know a lot of... When you're, when you're a professional rugby player, yes, you're in a privileged background. Yes, you get paid to do what you do. But if you're unable to do what you do, there's that existential crisis. Are you even a rugby player if you never play rugby? He has gone... You know, that all that rehab is such a horrific place to be every single day turning up, you know, when you don't know whether you're going to play, where things are still hurting, where you're training outside of hours, where you don't feel involved in, in the rest of the team, for him to finally do that. And I was concerned, actually, because before I saw him get back, I was like, you know what, is he ever going to be able to do this? Because so many players go along this path, we know, who just never make it back out of the rehab room. And for him to get, go through that and play, and, and to, to, you know, for, for, I was sadly lost, but for him to get an opportunity is amazing. And fingers crossed, he carries on and makes it back for, for England at some point. Good on you, Jack. Great to see you back and good luck with all that's to come. Um, I would love to ask everybody in just a second to offer a massive round of applause because there were two really sad bits of news in the last week as well. The first of which involved a young guy aged 27 who very sadly passed away playing for Evesham. His name was Jack Jeffrey. Um, it's the most utterly, utterly desperate news. His sister Daisy said that rugby was his biggest passion and he'd have been amazed by the response to his death from the global rugby community. It's been fantastic to see some of the tributes that have been paid to Jack. Uh, and secondly, Steve Black, who I know many in the room, you guys will particularly have known and worked alongside, who was the former Newcastle coach uh, who took on roles with Wales and the British and Irish Lions as well. He was a mentor to Johnny Wilkinson, Danny Cipriani, amongst a number of others. And again, amazing tributes have been pouring in for a quite remarkable character, a one in a million and I'm sure there'll be an acknowledgement of sorts at Twickenham on Saturday. Can we just have a massive round of applause for Jack and for Steve? Um, two men gone too soon. Um, wherever you're watching this weekend, guys, I hope you have a pint in the sky. And obviously all our thoughts go out to their, their nearest and dearest and friends and family at this point in time. Did you know, Steve, are you just before your time? No, I, I did do one training session with him down. I remember down at South Wales Police Ground and um, it was, we come out after lunch. You, you have a, back, in the, back in the days where you'd train in the morning, you'd have like a four hour break for lunch when you fill yourself full of food and then you'd come out for a team session. In the afternoon. my rig, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the buffet for us larger gentlemen, so we'd go up and help ourselves. And then, but I'd never forget, because obviously Steve's sort of unique skills around the softer stuff, around human beings, and sort of as a early 20s kid, back in Welsh rugby in, what, early 2000s, sort of this, the softer stuff of human beings, and the softer side of rugby wasn't the thing at the fore, but I remember coming out, and he spent, he said, right, for the next half an hour, lads, he said, I just want you to go out on the field and just have the game of your lives. So we all looked at him, sort of, What? He wanted us to go out as individuals and just play rugby with no ball, not with each other, just on our own, on a field. So you had people scoring tries in the corner, winning lineouts, front row forwards scrummaging and rolling around on the mud and all this sort of stuff. I'm looking around going, but it was, it was essentially his visualisation, wasn't it? But like in its sort of early, early form. But, you know, he did it in such a sort of charismatic way. You couldn't help buy into it, couldn't help but believe in it. You felt yeah. better after it. And, you know, that was, that, was black, that was blacky. Brilliant man. Who put a lot of smiles on a lot of faces and hopefully there'll be a, a pint raised by everybody at Twickenham uh, this weekend. Talking of which, I'm going to come to you. You're doing the game, aren't you, for, for French TV. Do you go to Twickenham on Saturday looking at two sides who are a little bit wobbly on the chassis at the moment? Or do you see two sides who are ready to explode? What sort of form are these two in? Heading into round three, I, I definitely hope ready to explode. Um, um, I, I go there with zero interest. I just want to see, uh, you know, a, a good, a good. I just Don't lie to our audience. No, but it's, it's true. You've been working with Hask for too long. It's it's completely because I'm not bothered about that game. Wait, I'll be honest. Put your hand up who you believed, you believed he's going there and not caring. No, listen, listen. Nobody worries. Be, before anything, we all adore rugby, right? 
Not rugby really. was boring with Not no really. fans. I, I, I prefer DJing. <laughs> uh, you know, you crack on. <laughs> I saw you. Yeah. That, that little flick. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> very, very good flick. <laughs> Um, <laughs> got paid though. <laughs> Why would you bother having I guests? Know. Though? I'm just quite just... close to finding the exit, actually. But keep going because this was good. No, listen, I, I'm just excited about seeing a, a fantastic game. I want to see some quality rugby delivered. England, eh, been disappointing, yes. But if they step up, they can be seriously good. I think Courtney Laws is back, right? I think yeah. he's a big talisman for England. He was absolutely out of this world good in November. I was blown away by his performances. Just one dude, one giant dude coming back in can make have a, a serious impact. Wales, I thought, were atrocious against Ireland. I thought they were really, really good uh, in, in Scotland when I was there. And again, you just need a bit of positive dynamism about it. And you don't know and they absolutely hate each other those two countries which makes it even better because they'll get all angry before you know and Not then and then we hate the french mate never forget that <laughs> Never, ever forget that, honestly. We, moment, actually, right? we actually got together and just went... And we used to run your country, but then we're like, we don't want it, you, you can have it back. <laughs> what is Never. he drinking? <laughs> Green King IPA, actually. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he will. Mix the Red Bull. Um, so, looking forward to a great game. That's, that's about Perfect it. answer, Ben. Yeah. Thank you. Are you nervous? Confident? Bullish in between? No, no, I, look, look it, it, is, it is a fixture that we'd love to take by. So, so the England rugby team are sort of everyone's big brother, aren't they? You know, we're just the, the little guys over the bridge who just like to come, come over. Fucking hell, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> do, 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 the tiniest little violin. You love all players. When you win, you're like, I can't believe it. Fuck you, England. <laughs> And you're like, oh, no, we're just, well, you know, you're just a bigger brother. I don't, believe... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I ever lost, so it's fine. I wouldn't know. Um... <laughs> no, so, look, look, Wales have got, uh, you know, had this sort of Gatlin era. They've got it in their DNA. They've become very difficult to beat them now. I think we saw, we saw what was great about the Scotland game is we showed that character. Very yeah. difficult to break down. They're well in defence. You know, what I think... You, what worries me is I don't think England are too far off clicking. You know, you look at Laws coming back, possibly to a lagging midfield, or if not, off the bench. You know, Marcus Smith, you know, I hope Eddie Jones takes him off early. Um, but, you know, he, he looks, he's attacking that line. You know, he's got options inside out, so he just seems to have so much time on the ball. You know, I'm concerned that if, if they get in front foot, the way he's playing, the way he's attacking, the way they're attacking the line, the way he keeps momentum when they get over the game line, I think this England team will be really difficult to stop. I think they will be confident or more confident after last weekend. So, you know, it, it, it could be it could be close. I don't know. I do worry if England go points up. I'm not sure Wales have got enough in their game to claw it back. Can I ask you a question? It's, it's quite a big question, but just looking at the Wales team, I was reading a few articles about the fact that the national team almost are are sort of defying everything below them. Uh, is Wales as an as a international team, are they getting away with it at the moment or are they the product of everything that's coming, coming through? Oh, that's a great question. You know, and undoubtedly, look, the, the financial model and economics Very of Welsh good. rugby is, comes, from, comes from the top, you know, and everything in Welsh rugby is supported, if you like, by the performance of the national team on the back of unprecedented success. If you look at that 2005, 6, 7 through the 17, 18, 19, you know, that's arguably as successful as the iconic 70s, you know, and financially as, as supports everything. The economics of the regions don't quite stack up. You've got four clubs in, what, 63 miles of each other with a population of 1.8, which is the same as Bristol, really. So it's, it's you know, nuts as a concept. So you can't have one without the other, you know, but if that national team falters for any long period of time, you would worry about the sustainability. But so I'm not sure. We won't know until... Till it happens. Yeah. What do you make of Wales at the moment? From the outside looking in. I mean, when we dissected the um, pre-Six Nations, we looked at it. You know, Wales has still got some fantastic players in that squad. You know, they've got some real talent. Actually, I think they've got some depth of talent. Some guys that they don't use. You know, obviously, it, looking at the back row, we talked about Thomas Young. We looked at the, the you know, the rest of the lineup. They're still on paper a fantastic side. Um, I think if you're playing Wales in Wales, from my experience, a completely different kettle of fish. You know, very uh, rarely won there, very difficult. You know, people always talk about the crowd as being the kind of 16th man or the, like, the third element. 
it's normally just rhetoric. You sort of, you know, when you, you, you know, especially at Twickenham, sort of, you know, I've said it before, sea of, sea of red trousers, barbers and prawn sandwiches and Guinness. Do you know what I mean? Like, if it's good, they're on board. If, it's, if, you're, not, if you're losing, they, they're, they're all looking around at everyone else to cheer. But the principality, you know, win or lose, the crowd is that far away from the field and they are giving it everything. I think Wales coming to Twickenham, in my experience, is different. And I think exactly what Ryan said, if you, if you get ahead, you're in, you're all more often than not going to win that game. And I think that it, it's got nothing to do with... There's no substance to it. There's no r rhyme or reason why that is. Because actually, you know, home advantage, it's unquantifiable. Do you know what I mean? It's not a thing. It's all down to mentality. Um, but it obviously does play a role. I think Wales are a quality outfit. But actually, I think exactly what Ryan said is that England are not far off from clicking and I'll be able to, to, to deal with it. I think Wales, you know, as a model, actually, I really believe in... I mean, I... Bill Sweeney's in the audience, so I'm very careful what I say, but in terms of central contact, uh, contracting and stuff like that, I, I actually think that's not far off the future to guarantee success. I think the reason England are not the most consistent number one team in the world is because you have 12 clubs with 12 self-interested um, views and ways of dealing with things. I think within Wales, because you have that central contract, you have that control, it almost doesn't really matter what happens at club level because everything is controlled by a central body. Is in England, you would go and do an England training session, the England coaches would come into WASP, we'd all sit around and have a conversation and go, right, we need you to do this extra fitness, this is what we need you to do. And everyone would go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the co England coaches would leave and be like, you're not doing that. And we would play in a completely different way. We play out of position. I think in Wales, I think it has benefited because of that central contracting, because of that security. Um, and I know they're not doing as well as they should do at club level, but they're, they're still a great outfit. And I think that, you know, have they delivered... I mean, you know, everyone, I'm a Welsh qualified and everyone loves telling me that if I'd played for Wales, A, I wouldn't have got in the side. But B, I would have won. <laughs> they love oh, You wouldn't have got in, mate. Lydiots, Warburton, we better than you. Jones. Well, I said we're chats better and Rick's better, but not Warburton. No, he's, he's like the leanest man in the world. He's like a fillet steak. Um, he is, honestly. He's unbelievably lean, isn't he? He's like so lean. No chat, but unbelievably lean. Um, it's terrible on the piss as well. It doesn't drink, so, you know, win or lose. Awful behind the decks. Um, <laughs> Great, oi, great presenter, so swings and roundabouts. Um, but looking at his, his lot of little notes here, but, you know, they, you, you know, you wouldn't want... I mean, if I had the same career in Wales, we would have won three or four Grand Slaps in that period of time, and we didn't do that with England. I managed to get one. So they are still a force to be reckoned with, but they're probably not where they want to be. And actually, I think this weekend will be a great leveller to see where we are. But actually, thank God we're on home soil, because I think it gives England the advantage. It's very nice to have the RFU chief exec, Bill Sweeney, here. If we could have central contracts by Monday, Hask would be very grateful, so take that one away with you. I'll take team manager on 300 grand a year. No, you won't. It's a discount because we get on, Bill. I was going to give you some rugby noors. We love it. We don't get nearly enough. We desperately need that. So you talk about the Principality Stadium being the best rugby stadium in the world, which I think, you know, certainly my opinion, but certainly visiting players and fans alike. So row one at Twickenham on the weekend is row 16 in the Principality Stadium. So that's how much closer the fans that are to the pitch. Great stat. You know that that pitch was only ever designed. Uh, that stadium was only ever designed to hold a rugby pitch, 110 by 70. And you know you basically can't fit fuck all else in it. Is it? But yeah. so it was just designed for that. The upper stand, the upper stand is at 34 degrees, which is the steepest within British building law that you can have it. You know, so it was done purely for the product on the field and to create an amazing, amazing atmosphere as well. So just, you know, a bit of... No, but, you have justified your fee with no, but, those two stats, regardless. It is true. I, so I made my debut in, in uh, it, it was the millennium then, 2007. Right, and again, everyone always says to you, your fa friends and family, did you hear us in the crowd? You're like, yeah, mum, I did, but you obviously don't, right? And your mates, you're like, yeah, I can't. Five metres from the Welsh line, when you're five, five points behind, the, the sound from the crowd, and bear in mind, when you look at Twickenham, it's a sea of people, and when you sing the national anthem, you look out, your friends and family, you have this real proud moment. But in the game, it's a blur. When you're running around in Prince you, you see individual faces. A lot of people giving me the finger, which... <laughs> wait, mainly my mum. I was like, mum, <laughs> stop, stop doing that. But you, it, you can actually see it. And, it, and when, when, you're, when you're behind and you're so close to their line, it is like an oppressive force pushing on your head and it has an effect and for me that is where rugby needs to go it's about the spectacle it's about the occasion so obviously you know we're in a fantastic Green King pub if you can't get to a stadium you can't get a ticket get your local pub 
you're welcome. But if you, <laughs> but if you can get to a stadium, yeah, yeah. if you can get to a stadium, that those experiences and every stadium should be built on that principle to allow the crowd to be that close. And also, you know, it, 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 rugby crowds are so middle class and no one's throwing any coins or bottles so you're, you can have that football there needs to be seven miles actually football fans might as well stay at home would probably be safer but I think the principality is the perfect model for me good thankfully it's at Twickenham this weekend so let's move it on to the game that we have actually got Twickenham's okay as well I like it as well um, everything always begins and ends up front who shades it in the dark arts who shades it? Um, I think for one, you can have a, th have a, a little thought for Luke Kowandiki, who's going through some tough weeks and uh, lost his spot. It will be interesting to see, you know, who, who plays and who doesn't. All I know is that, um, like, like, like we said, you know, Ken Owens is, is a huge miss for Wales. They desperately want him back. He's not there at the moment. You can tell there's a little bit of... How do you say that? Um, a lack of leadership, lack of ownership of that responsibility up front. So I still think uh, England got the upper hand. If anything, they were rubbish against Scotland, but in, uh, up front they really dominated. They just didn't do enough with it. Um, thinking about the driving mall, thinking about their scrummaging ability and, and all those things. So um, looking forward to see that battle. I don't think it's going to be one or lost there. I still think England just have to do more than what they're able to do at the moment. Okay. Two quick fire questions. Obviously, we record on a Monday, goes out on a Wednesday, team named on Thursday, so this may all be redundant pretty quickly. Alfie Barbary, would you stick him on the bench? Or time not quite come yet? Did you, was he at Wasps with you as a young pub? He was. Um, <laughs> he was. He was very young Not when I was... important enough for you to have talk, no, spoken I, to no, him. No, I did. While my England career was heading towards the toilet, I played in something I'd never heard of, which is the um, Anglo-Welsh Cup. I, I thought everyone, when they weren't playing for England, <laughs> had, a, had a week off. I'd have discovered this horrific tournament where you had to go round to the regions and play garbage teams. So I... <laughs> Not wanting to pretend I was too arrogant, I said to Di, listen, I'll, I'll do it, thinking he'd give me a rest, but he didn't. So I was playing with all these 14-year-olds with my, my corrective shoes on, I couldn't even run. And Alfie came on and absolutely carved up. And after the game, he'd made the cardinal sin of forgetting any black socks and had white socks with black shoes that looked like Michael Jackson. And had basically hidden in the changing room waiting for me not to see him. And I was in the, in the room after uh, uh, the bar with all the families. The last person he wanted to see was me. And as he came through, they went, ha, ha, Shimon, hee, hee. <laughs> the, whole, the whole time. And it, yeah. So that's why. So basically, I bullied him. And now he's in the England side. So they all call it character building. But I would love to see him because he, he's incredible and has all the skills I could only dream of. And I think, why not put him, give him an opportunity? Because you've got to give it some time. I know Jamie George, great servant. Luke Cowan Dickey had that error. Listen, I made more errors than most people. You know, you just have one of those brain meltdowns. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I, I've looked back at a lot of what I've done in life going, I don't even remember doing that and how I did it. I think it's one of those things where he just had a sort of brain fart and it happened. So you can't hold that against him. We all move on. That's the nature of sport. But I'd love at some point to see Alfie Barbary, as long as he remembers his, his right socks. I was going to ask you Randall Youngs, but God knows where you're going to go with that. Who? Ra Randall Youngs. Harry Randall, oh, who yeah. started at nine for England yeah. at your country yeah. last weekend. Or Ben yeah. Youngs, who you played um, with for about I, 15 I, I, years. Listen, I love Ben Youngs. I think the fact he's equalled uh, Jason Leonard's record. I'm a real... Stick, I don't want, you know, I want to see Courtney get 100, now he's on 90. I want to see Ben Youngs break that record, I love it. I know Tins is a bit more passionate about the nine role. I'd say I thought the way Randall played in my nausea moment last week when I talked about being in motion, I thought he was fantastic. I thought he changed the dynamic of the way the team played. I think aside at Wales, like against Wales, you need to have that momentum. So I would 100% start with Randall and have Youngs um, on the bench. Okay. But that's not personal, Ben, because I want to see you break the record. But I would just say for nausea purposes, and I can't be too much of a fan. Caveat, caveat. If it's going to happen for Wales, what needs to happen? Who's, who needs to make it happen? Well, Tuolagi doesn't need to play. Corley right. Laws probably doesn't need, to, doesn't need to play, so that would probably be a good start. It's an interesting place to start, so, yeah. No. Look, I think, you know, we, we talked about briefly, I, I think up front, I think it will dictate the game. So yeah. that front five, particularly, because if Wales are unable to get possession, like they weren't, weren't able in Ireland. If they're unable to stop England at source, it could be a real long day with Harry Randall, Marcus Smith, you know, th them coming on the ball at pace with momentum. I think it could be a really, really tough day. I think for Wales to win, they're going to need big performances from big players. So Thomas Williams was excellent at nine last week. Biggs is going to have to run the game. And I think they're only, if they can dominate territory, 
which I think is probably the most important stat at the moment in, in modern rugby, I think they'll do really well. And that's going to, that'll be largely dictated to by bigs. We need to see more from Louis Rizamet, who's been probably a bit anonymous for the first couple of weeks, you know, but 100% you've got to play him. I'd like to see Josh Adams come back because he's, he's just got that niggle, he's got that edge that, you know, I think this, this type of game requires. Liam Williams, big, another big game from him could, could be could be influential. I think Jonathan Davis has got to play in midfield. I just think we need to sort of shore up that midfield. You've got to Twickenham, you need his experience. I expect to see Tulupe Falato figure. Would you check him straight in? I'd start him, you know. I think when, when you, we're talking about a, someone who's world, a genuinely world-class player. Yeah. You know, those, those guys don't need many games to get back up to speed. We saw Alan Wynn do it, coming back on the Lions tour and the like. He's in that category and I think it's going to require players like him uh, in that venue to, to win a fixture like this. So, yeah. you know, I, I'd, I'd take a punt with him. I'd start him as well because that way, if he's not going well or he's, he does have a bump, you can bring him off rather than bring him off the bench. But, you know, I, I just think there's some big key battles in there, particularly up front. You had some very famous days with Wales. Is there anything quite as sweet as winning at Twickenham? No, I, well, I was, I was, well, I was captain the day in two thousand and eight. <laughs> well, it didn't take long. Well, it's, it's, exactly. it's an hour. It's an hour in. That, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you've done very well to get so, that far. Yeah, so three mentions of the captaincy. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So I was, really, you know, so that was I, I remember that day very, very well. So and that, you, that was, was that was that Australia. Yeah, Australia. that was when the Ospreys beat England. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. When Welsh rugby, Welsh regional rugby was good. So there's 13, 13 Ospreys started that game yeah. um, with Mike Williams and, and Mark Jones. But that was Gats's first ever game in charge. You know, was, I mean never forget Sean Edwards' speech before the game who unbelievably passionate Englishman who hates England <laughs> he was brilliant that day you know but we were what 19 or 16 1960 were, yeah. we were just about 10 minutes in the second half Hugh Bennett had stopped Paul Sackey scoring in the corner just before half time and we were, we were done and dusted you know we were we managed to hang on got in at half time and then Basically, second half, I think we scored 20 unanswered points. It was 26-19 final score. You know, Hask and Tins then walk off, head, uh, head in their hands, and we were into Richmond and had a, <laughs> a fantastic celebration. And No, but it is, it is a wonderful place. You know, I, I love playing at Twickenham, getting off of the bus, you know, by the gates with the, with the liars on and walking through and all the people on the concourse and all that. And, you know, there, there is a fantastic rugby history too to Twickenham, but to go there as a Welshman and win is, is pretty special, really. Good. That's the team talk done then, isn't it? What three things go on England's whiteboard this week? I was just thinking about the difference, what it'd be like driving into through Twickenham with a bus, you know, from a, as a Welsh team through the Golden Gates, people shaking their Guinnesses and prawn sandwiches, you Clinking know. Their yeah, yeah, with yeah, a signet yeah. ring. Sipping, you drive through Cardiff, people are throwing their own shit at the bus, <laughs> people are headbutting it, you know, like... <laughs> Elderly relatives who are like waving, they're swearing at you. Someone's got out the head butted the bus first, 2007, stepped over the barrier, head butted, split he their head. He messaged you. Oh, did, did you tell that story a couple of weeks ago? Did he then message you? I oh, know that, that was the guy whose glasses it was. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So we told a story, you know, going through Cardiff, uh, there's a long story, but somebody, somehow a fan was being quite rude and he got invited onto the England bus. <laughs> I don't know why they stopped because none of the coaches and something happened to him and the, uh, the guy actually messaged me going, oh, thank God you didn't embellish the story because I think Joe Marler's told a similar story where the bloke, bloke basically got his glasses snapped and thrown off the bus but apparently other people have said he got filled in but he should have done. Don't ever message me again. Um, <laughs> But um, no, I think the three things. I think the three things for us is is, is focus solely, worry about yourselves first and foremost. I think um, being in motion and that dynamism, and actually, I think respecting um, the field position. When when to when to play slow and make sure you make exits because actually, on, you know. Talking about Lewis Rees Samet, for example, you know, the guy could score from anywhere. If you're loose against Wales and you're dangerous and they get that upper hand, there is many, many times that we've gone into a, Wel a Welsh team that have probably not had the momentum they wanted to and they've absolutely stuffed us. And I think if you're in your own 22, take that time around halfway alone to have that patience and then when it's an opportunity to attack, make sure you come away with points and build a score. We've noticed in the Six Nations that so many of these games have finished by such a small margin, you have to build a score. If there's an opportunity to take points... You know, I mean, again, my criticism against Scotland was you should have gone for those three. I would always take a draw. I would always keep things ticking over. If you look to Ireland against France or France against Ireland, they 
kept just chipping away at the scoreboard, chipping away at the scoreboard, and suddenly, you know, you're 17, 20 points in, in place with a couple of tries. That, for me, has got to be part of England's agenda. Yeah, I was, I was say, you touched on an interesting point there. I think decision-making is really important. With the way the laws have changed now, with the dro goal-line dropout and things like that, I think those decisions are becoming costly. You know, if you, if you choose to keep the pressure on and don't get points, and you can cede huge amounts of territory, or even just kick three... We're seeing point, you know, we're seeing teams concede territory and then concede seven. So those sorts of big decisions with your, you know, sort of finger on the pulse. So we've really, you know, we've got, are we in the arm wrestle? Have we got, off, you know, are we really squeeze in England? Are we going to go for the points? Are we going to go for keep the scoreboard ticking over? They're the things I think will dictate a fixture like this. Okay, I'm going to ask you who you think will win a bit later on. Who would you like to win? Well, <sighs> um. Well, to be honest, I think I would have to pick Wales just because I, I want the outsider. I want the outsider to win, but I couldn't care less. I just want a good game. I want people to enjoy. Can we please speak about France? I mean, you we, promised we were going to speak about read and then we're doing we France. Speak about Michael Jackson, woo -hoo, and, then, and then South Africa and all those things. But, mate, speak about that, the games that that's matter. That's what this show does. Right, just before we come on to France, we've got a little note from Honda on the pod this week, who are the official performance partner of England Rugby. They'll be hoping for big things at Twickenham on Saturday. And Honda obviously bringing the power of dreams to the game that we all love here tonight, as well as playing a big role with the volunteers in the English game, who are certainly needed right now, the volunteers, a nod to you. Honda are also developing a real understanding of how English fans feel about the game, the supporters' relationship with the team, their achievements, the hopes, and those who dream the impossible dreams. Honda believes in a challenging spirit, embracing failure, which is why they are back with us for week three, and the joy of trying things as well, and just like England Rugby and their supporters, as we said, Honda believes in the power of dreams, and you can find out more at honda.co.uk forward slash engine room forward slash honda x rfu so head there if you'd like to uh, get stuck into that france <laughs> it's Off about time field. so we said before the tournament started this year that scotland will ruin somebody's dreams they actually ruined their own dreams last last week which was a shame um <laughs> It's the first, England have no friends in the Six Nations at all, but I've really enjoyed the double moment. We've had two laughs now between the two of you at Scotland's expense. Are you nervous going to the Scottish capital? Are you confident? Are you... Or do you not really care? As, as no, really no, I 100% fans? care for this one. I'm, I'm switched Great. on now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm back. Um, I care massively. I am scared. Because let's not forget that we, we, you talk about, you know, Scotland ruining it for themselves. We've been doing that for the last decade, pretty much. So don't forget that last time we went to Scotland, Mohamed Awaz punched a guy in the face and got a red card. The year even before, they got taken off the, the plane for some assault charges that were very, very serious. We are the best in the world to cock it up. Let's face it. So are they, are they um, favourites? Absolutely. I mean, look, you look at the game against Ireland. I think France actually took it up a, another level. I was blown away by the performance in November against the All Blacks. I was uh, ecstatic about how they perform, about the guys that they, they, they've got. Yes, I was a little bit worried because they had a bit of a, a weird preparation with COVID outbreaks in Toulouse and all that. So they were sort of in and out. Did the job against Italy, facing Ireland, who were hot at the moment, and, and did really, really well. And it was a sensational game for everybody to watch. Now, different figures. Like I was telling the boys before, um, I don't know if you guys have watched Fabian Galtier on TikTok. It's worth it. It's amazing. Just, just have a look. But there's only us to do bloody that. I mean, the, the, the Wafflegate. The Wafflegate is something that, we, that was self-French created when, when, when everything was going well. We decided to have those, the, those waffle moments that were a little bit out there. Now, Fabien Galtier is dancing TikTok moves with his, with his daughter, which is fantastic. But he's still portraying himself as being loose and edgy and, 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 and a bit crazy. Do, do you think he wanted that to get up? If you haven't seen it, it is well worth looking at. I mean, you, you'll be all over it. But it is, it's not what you'd expect it's, the French head coach to be doing. Well, it, 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 is he trying to be man I, of the people? I don't see Gats doing that. Let's just put it that well, way. No, if, no, Gats has been done that. dancing in the sunshine before, but, but not during a Six Nations tournament. I, I just... Yeah. Did he mean for it to, go, to come out? Uh, yes. He's, yeah, he's, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, if TikTok is live and he's recording and he pressed the button, you know, Six he's Nation sort of sponsor. Means Perhaps he's looking for a little bit of a ambassadorial. Thing. No, all I think is that he's, he's, a, he's a complicated character. He's a strategic genius, yes, but he can be very edgy as a person. Does that reflect on the whole squad? Absolutely not. They are a sensational bunch of, of, of blokes and stuff. I think what he's trying to give to, to the team is to say, you might as well back yourself. You might as well... Uh, allow yourself to dream of how good you are at the moment and, and allow yourself to describe how good you are. So if it's just him doing something with his daughter, fair enough. I'm just thinking, I'm very wary. 
You never know what can happen in a field. Yeah. The conditions can be dreadful. The ref can be dreadful. Some guy can punch some guy, whatever happens, and then all your dreams collapse. So I am, I am on red alert because I want them to do well. I knew that they would step up against Ireland because there was 85,000 people in Paris absolutely going berserk over it. They will definitely front up against England because it's just that rivalry. The biggest slip up is going to be going to Murrayfield thinking it's already won and going to, to Principality Stadium with Wales who've got you know nothing to lose, can play a very open game. Each just never know what can happen too. So these are the games that really scare me. Interesting. Imagine Eddie Jones doing a TikTok. <laughs> just think about that for one minute. I think you need, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because... If, if there's a deal in it. I mean, listen, <laughs> I was on OnlyFans, so I have no <laughs> scruples, but I would say that I think in a certain position, you've got to set a standard, do you know what I mean? Like, this is modernising the game, James. It, it, this is the French no, head it, coach going to the people on social media. This is what you'll be yeah, campaigning no, for I, I, for months. I, I yeah, say, perfect. No, I would, say, I would say that when you have... You, you want people to be accessible, right? And you want... And when people talk about leadership and business and everything else, they want to have a direction and they want someone to be approachable, but you need to keep that air of kind of uh, untouchable invincibility. You cannot ever be too accessible. And doing something like that, it just, it, you know, it's, 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 it's watering yourself down. It's just no good. You need to, ha it ain't, you know, Galtier needs to be on a pedestal where, you know, you can have a chat when you can walk past him. But you can't be doing TikTok, Chief. Like, you just, I don't think anyone else would do that. I, totally, I do TikTok. You, you, all the time. you, you, you could totally, be listening to I totally own... screw that. Like, I haven't seen it, right? So I would caveat it with that. But Wait till you see my OnlyFans. <laughs> Actually, but if, you know, it, modern leadership, if he's shown a human side, if it is with his daughter, I don't, you know, I, don't, I think that's. I think that's okay. I think gone are the days of sort of this untouchable head coach who was king of all because that's not modern leadership. That's not what young young players want to see or expect anymore. They want someone who they can relate I, I to. I would say that you, you want it to be accessible. I, I think I don't mind being accessible mid level, but I just think that you as a you just want that. There's nothing worse than having a leader, or you know, when people talk about, and I'm not, I'm going to be a parent, fingers crossed. But you, you, you have that thing where you, you don't want to be your best friends with your coach. You need to have that boundaries, right? You need to have that understanding. And I think that yes, uh, the human touch, exactly what you, is completely missing in rugby a lot of the time. You need to have that nuance, ability to understand how your players operate, be able to be level, accessible, be able to communicate. But also, you need to still know who's in charge. And I'm not, I, I, it sounds like I give a shit more than I actually do. I actually don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, gen, gen, like, no, genuinely. Just arguing for the sake it, of it. Yeah, I yeah. Say, I, Familiar with that. for the sake of it because I actually don't, I don't care. I would just say, from my opinion, would I want my head coach doing that? No, I love it when Eddie Jones went into world's media and pulled someone's pants down and mugged them. Not well, metaphorically, that would be weird. <laughs> and, mugged, and mugged people off and said, called a journalist out. As a player, you'd go, I love that. If Eddie Jones was doing TikTok stuff, I don't think it shows more of a human side. I think it's lost the plot. Do you know what I mean? So, I, but I don't disagree with you. The, the point you just need to have certain boundaries, and I don't care. I've not seen it. France is going to win the Six Nations. I've got every confidence of it, and I think Galtier is an amazing coach. I would just say it's an interesting choice for someone in a rarefied atmosphere on a certain journey to go and do that. You know, like, you know, if you if I'd done it, you'd be like, oh, that's not out of character. The guy's a dickhead. Galtier, you, you sort of need to think a little bit more. I think without being that bothered about it, even though I sound like I am. Where are your love levels for French rugby at the moment? Big love, really? Yeah, no. Look, I think. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, it, it, this has been a well-designed project. You know, I've been working with FFR for a while to, to peak for that World Cup that's coming in France. You know, this this is a this isn't a coincidence that they're peaking now. This is on the back of what four or five years of great under twenties rugby, big invest, big investment in that sort of process, competitive club rugby. You know, and all of a sudden now they've got. Everything that was great about French rugby that they've had, whether the results have gone their way or not, they, they are, they do play with a flair. They've got an unbelievable physicality. But now they've just seemed to have some discipline. They've got some more structure. They've got that sort of Sean Edwards-esque factor in there. Do you keep in touch with Sean at all? Monsieur no, Sean, Sean Edwards? Doesn't, Sean doesn't keep in touch with anyone. Right. So, Enigma. But, no, he's, but he's an interesting character, but he's, good, he's great to have in that, in that environment if he's managed and supported to allow him to be good at what he does. But you can see all these sorts of pieces of the puzzle coming together in, in French rugby. They've got a set piece that is as good as anyone else's in the world. You know, so all of a sudden, you've got all the raw ingredients of, you know, a top top three team in the world, you know, and yeah. coming together, peaking at the right time. 
final question on this game. We're talking up France and everyone is loving France, yeah. but given the hype factor around Scotland eight days ago yeah. recording this, they could have probably should have won in Cardiff. This is a massive game for them because suddenly to go from a Calcutta Cup win looking like they're going to win in Cardiff, but then suddenly losing Cardiff, losing at home to France, suddenly it's, it's back to square one again, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot yeah, of I mean, pressure on the boys north of the it, border. Yeah, look, I, th I think it's always a big cliche when you always talk about Six Nations, but actually this is the closest on paper. I think anyone can beat anyone, gen genuinely, apart from, from, from Italy. No offence, but... Genuinely, you, ain't, you know, you'd be lucky. Um, but I, I think f for me, that is a massive amount of pressure on on both sides. I would say, just as an aside, for me, France, I, I've, you know, I, I'm a complete converted French supporter. Obviously, when you're playing them, you want to you want to beat them. They're playing with such flair, such the, the, the dynamism of every single player. That the, the coaching box might be the sexiest set of men I've ever seen. I'm not even into lads, but they're unbelievable, yes. right? They, you know, I mean, they haven't put Sean Edwards in there because all the rest of them are wearing sort of matching shoes. If Sean Edwards in there, we're wearing a bomber jacket, a flat cap, <laughs> trainers, tartan trousers. Then you got the rest of them in absolute chic black tie with the thin black tie. Rafa Libanez is just beautiful. Um, and you know, I, 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 look, I think the world's a better place for them. I think. What, what always happens in these Six Nations is, is fans, because they've got not a rational thought in their body, they just get so hyped up and caught with it, and that's why everybody loves sport. You know, I think there is uh, pressure on Scotland, but actually France, in my mind, should actually walk this game. They are just light years above everybody. I hope they do. If they, if they don't, I don't mind. If Scotland win, it's great for the game and the, and the story continues. But I'd say every time we hype a side up, if you look at the fundamentals, who's hyped them up? Well, it's normally people who just hype anyone up, and that's what we, we, we do, especially in our media. We build someone up, we cut them down, we build them up. That's the nature of sport. If we knew who were going to win, we'd have no betting industry, we'd have nothing about it. So let's just enjoy the ride. But remember, win or lose, let's get on the booze and just have a, you know, just smile. <laughs> on the Green King. On the Green King, Love responsibly. <clears throat> ideally in your local oh, top. That's my favourite Warren, that's my favourite Warren Gatland mantra that was. You see, don't win championships drinking orange juice. So you celebrate the good times all the way along. <laughs> that wasn't a banner. He used to have a banner saying defence wins championships I like, I like the better one that you've come up with um, I don't want to be that guy but I don't really know what the question is around Ireland Italy I mean what hope for Italy other than thunder lightning five red cards can they get close to Ireland bus breaks down bus breaks down, down. That's, yeah. that's how COVID, I'd say they get it four match yeah. points I mean, is there a hope in hell? No, no, honestly, it's, I don't think there is any, uh, but I think that's irrelevant. Uh, you also got to say that if we had a fantastic France-Ireland game, it's because there's a fantastic Irish team at the moment. So just enjoy them, and they're probably going to pump Italy, and, and it's going to be a great game of rugby, and hopefully we'll see plenty of tries, and everybody have a good time. I think hopefully Ireland will get, will be able to blood some different players we haven't seen, get some guys who haven't had that kind of spotlight, a bit more exposure. That, you know, for, look... I, we, I think Italy is way better than where it was. I think we want a strong Italian side. Uh, you know, we, uh, we under 20s have beat England twice in a row now. It's unheard of. They're obviously developing. They need much more funding across the grassroots game. You know, they compete against football, which is, you know, if you think football's big in England, it's light years ahead in Italy. That's all yeah. everyone wants to do. But they're on the right track. Are they going to beat Ireland? No. Is an opportunity to just enjoy rugby, sit with a pint before the rest of the weekend. Yeah, crack on. Cool. Um, if you haven't already seen it, it's well worth digging out, actually. We've done some filming with Hask and his pal Bertie. Uh, the Predictor game is up and running on the social channels. Was that a yay from Chloe? Oh, it's all over there! Yay! Um, Bertie the Predictor's been up and running. He's doing extremely well. It's based on Paul the Octopus from the 2010 Football World Cup. I think Bertie's doing better than you in terms of predictions so far this season. Two out of three in round one and two out of three in round two. Have a look at Hask's social channels for Bertie's round three predictions. Can you remember what he's done? No. No. No, okay. Uh, thank you to City Index, though, for making Bertie the Predictor a reality. Um, City Index, of course, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. Let's skip through the predictions. I know you hate these, but I'm going to ask you, England-Wales is going to finish up where? I would say um, England by 10. Yeah, I, th I think England will win. Um, I don't... I think it might be a bit more. I think it'll be... I'll go England by 12. Go on, then. Wow. Oh, calm down, you mentalist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go England by three. Oh, hello. French oh, again. Ooh, yeah. I just want to have a good game. I don't, I don't care. where he is, ladies and gentlemen. He's in the heart of London. We've confiscated his beret, his small unicycle. His He's on the bicyclette. Um, Scotland, France. Yes, I, I, I see, obviously, France winning them. Um, I don't think it will be a, very, a huge win, so I'll go France by three. Oh. 
France by 15. Ooh. Wow. Play. He's trying to play it down. France by 10. Okay. And Ireland, <laughs> Italy. <laughs> That's it. Same number, stuck on repeat. Ireland, Italy. Ireland by 10. Uh, <laughs> Ireland by 35. Wow. Yeah, I was going to say 32. Okay. Oh, Ireland pop. being always just within two points. Have an original thought. Same big one, 36, for the sake of it. Okay, here is to a very good weekend of rugby. Just before we go, um, it's time to bring in our... Come on, come on in, Josh. Can we have a round of applause for Josh, who puts in an enormous amount of hard work behind the scenes. By the way, ladies, he's single. We've got our friends at Domino's who are partnering with us over the Six Nations. Top box only, as it has seen the other pizza. Uh, this is for our dough baller of the week. A lot of thought went into that. Uh, so oh. these are exclusive gb and dough balls. It's made especially for us, although there were more, but your missus has had a couple. Yeah. Just feeding the She's baby. She's pregnant. You don't want to mix exactly. with her. Uh, thank you to Domino's for doing that. Our dough baller of the week with our Six Nations partner, Domino's. Uh, player of the first two rounds. Think of someone who, <laughs> I think we had, um, oh, Hask, Hask is really struggling yeah. already. Um, so who's gone really well? Well, it's got to be, it's probably got to be. Yeah, it yeah. has to be him. Three tries against Italy and then absolutely killed against uh, Ireland. For the little story, three years ago, he used to play National One. The equivalent, third division, got, sorry, wanted to play nine, and his third division team told him, you're not good enough. So he said, all right, all right, stuff it, I'll go with the France Sevens. He went to like a development tour, then got picked up by France Sevens, did really well, and then ended up playing in second division. Got picked up by Toulon, and then and, and the rest is history. You know those players, you, you had exactly this with Jonathan Davis, which is that he, for so many years, has played under a scrum cap. You never actually know what... What is under the scrum yeah. cap? It's just always a blur. But Gavin Villiers is going to be another one of those. You don't necessarily get to know a lot about the man because he's always sort of. Do you know what I mean or not? not no, obviously not. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's got a scrum. You know, he takes the scrum back uh, off uh, after the oh, game. Does he? Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. No, no, he's, he's actually a normal but, bloke. But, yeah, but, but you, you know, those players him, so... who are less identifiable because so, they are. So Fox, Jonathan Fox, we're good mates. That's why I call him Foxy, but you probably can't. Um, Jonathan Davis. <laughs> I, 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 I played against him a ton of times. Had no idea, you just saw the outline of his face. And then post-match, I didn't know who I was looking at, so I didn't know it was him. And in, in Japan, I walked past him a couple of times. I thought it was a fan asking for an autograph. I was like, in a minute, Chief. And it, and it turns out he's one of Wales' greatest ever centres. And he's an absolute dreamboat underneath that yeah. as well. So you just don't know. So yeah, they try to... You know to, what I mean? Yeah, 100%. 100% yeah. I know what you mean. You just don't recognise him. You just don't compute. And also, sometimes when they take the scrum cap off, like, like me, you've got no lid left, and their ears pop straight out. You're like, whoa, put that scrum cap back on. But he's actually very dreamy, you know. And they wanted me to play without... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we're talking about his yeah. looks. Well, I'm just talking it's, about it's him as a character. Like, I don't know a lot about him because it seems he's always tucked into a scrum cap. So he's, I mean? he's, he's definitely worth the chat and the discovery. Yeah. Because of his unique history, he's a very, very chilled, very relaxed, very humble, and just... You know, I think you can see it the way that he plays. Like me, he just, wants to, en he just <laughs> wants to enjoy it, and he will take on absolutely anyone because he's not the biggest dude. He's, he's actually pretty small. Right, I think the scrum cap is the only similarity. Um, any final thoughts? Where are you watching? Oh, we're off to Twickenham this weekend. We are off to Twickenham. We're looking at the players' lounge. lounge. Yeah, it'll be good fun. Are we expecting a belting just weekend of Six Nations action? I, I think for such a long time we were starved of, of uh, you know, crowds. The last Six Nations we played was empty stadiums. I think we had the Autumn Internationals, which was a nice sort of taste back into that. But you cannot underplay the rivalry between all these Six Nations teams, especially England and Wales, you know, for the fans, for the media, this is a massive spectacle. For the, for the players, you know, after Italy, England want to keep that momentum. Wales, having started, you know, uh, not great, and then to beat Scotland, they want to carry that momentum. It's coming into a melting pot of a full, all singing or dancing Twickenham. What more do you mean? And at the end of the day, the old cliche, but rugby will be the winner, come what may. I'm just excited to go back there and, and obviously keep the fans at an arm length behind a velvet rope. Is that my missus called? Yeah, it is. Your it's, your it's your taxi. That's it's about police. four hours late, sadly. It's the police. Are you, are you coming on Saturday? I am. If you need a token Welshman to take the piss out of you, just Absolutely. let me know. It's fine. You, so I'm... You've earned your spurs. You yeah, are thanks. more than welcome any time. Um, we will leave it there. What, what a party we've got to look forward to as we say goodbye to our listeners and our viewers. We've got Green King, we've got Red Bull and we've got Domino's on the table. I hope you'll all stick around for a drink or two as well. But ladies and gents, just one final word from me. A reminder that Domino's are offering 50% off pizza when you spend £30 or more online throughout the Six Nations. A big thank you to the team at Domino's. We are loving the collaboration, as you can probably tell. Um, before we get out of there, uh, out of here rather, that is it from us uh, at the Globe in Marylebone. I can never say Marylebone. 
If I, if I got that right, you know well, those you've got, words. You've got someone to say it for you, haven't uh, you? Yeah, Jeeves. I need, so, I need more. I need more. Marley bones, sir. <laughs> I, I need more marbles. Um, thank you to the Globe. Thank you to Red Bull, which, as I'm sure you'll agree, has been transformed into the best seat in the house. We'll have a cheer, please, for Green King and for Red Bull and for Domino's. Thank you for all that support. If you're in the London area, make sure you get down here for the games uh, for the remainder of the Six Nations. Normal service resumes next week. We'll be back in our usual cupboard uh, to debrief on all things England, Wales and the other games. We have been the Good, the Bad and the Rugby in partnership with City Index. Good, the Bad and Rugby is a folding pocket production. Would you finish, please, with an enormous round of applause for Ben, for Ryan and for the Haas. Enjoy the rugby this weekend and we'll see you again very soon indeed. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening.